Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is screenwriter and educator, Ross Brown. Ross, welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, um, people are gonna be really happy they watched this episode, I think, Ross. Cool. <laughs> um, so you're, you've been involved in, in writing for the screen and mostly for, for television um, for a good long time. Yeah, no, I've, I've had a really uh, lengthy career. I'm old now, so yeah. I, uh, but I, I actually started out I, my goal was to be a writer, but I wasn't good enough to be a writer when I first got out of college, right. and not a professional one at okay. least. And you, you had a, a degree in journalism. I had a degree in journalism. I went to UC Berkeley. Um, but while I was in college, uh, my father, who was in advertising, helped me get a job as a gopher, as it was known, a production mm -hmm. assistant mm -hmm. for a company that made TV commercials. Right. Not an ad agency, but a film company. Right. And I just got the film bug then. Yeah. I really loved doing it and uh, shot, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken yeah. commercials, met the Colonel. And, and <laughs> did all you really? I did. <laughs> I met the Colonel. Uh, stood in for a dog in a dog food commercial. Yeah, how did, how did you do that? Well, the, the deal was they didn't want to tire out the star dog. Right. And it was cheaper to hire me than to hire a second dog right. at that point in time because that would have meant hiring a second union animal right. handler. Right. So I think there was some good natured hazing going on too. <laughs> so I would get down on my hands and knees in front of the bowl and they'd say things like, could you move your right paw a little closer <laughs> to the bowl? Um, but, I, but I learned a really valuable lesson, which was if you went into things with a good attitude, then those guys who had so much knowledge were willing to share anything with uh, me okay. about lighting, about filmmaking. Uh -huh. And so I learned a ton there and went from there to being a production assistant on uh, TV shows and movies. And when I would be unemployed, I'd write spec scripts, sample uh -huh. scripts for existing sitcoms, right. which was my goal. And eventually got good enough to uh, get an agent and then start a writing career. Right. Well, I'm gonna go back to the, the moment in the commercials. I mean, what was it about being there making, you know, an, an Alpo commercial or a KFC commercial that, that made you think, God, this is something I really wanna do? You know, I it was just the whole notion that we're filming this, and then I'm going to see it on TV. Right, yeah. And uh, you know, and and you know, it's very funny stuff when you're actually that's the Colonel. Right. And in fa and in fact, uh, well, the Colonel has since passed yeah, away. Yeah, so last yeah. But that's what they were worried about at the time. So the the commercial at that time was for uh, country style Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh -huh. It was brand new then, and it was a county fair taste test. And right. somebody would go, mm, "That's good chicken," and then the Colonel would say, "That's my new country style recipe." But the uh, company was owned by a food conglomerate by yeah. then, and they were terrified that the colonel would die and then it would be in bad taste to air the commercial. <laughs> so we shot with an alternate spokesman also, oh, and the right. person would go, mm, that's good yeah. chicken, and then not a lookalike, but right. just somebody else on the colonel's mark right. would say, that's the colonel's new country style ah, recipe. Okay. The catch was you couldn't let the colonel know you were planning for yeah. his demise. <laughs> so we'd film with the colonel and say, that's fabulous colonel, and then send him back to his motor home and sneak the other guy in the back of the tent. And then my that. job was to stand outside, and if the colonel emerged from his motorhome, he had to warn him, everybody, yeah. hide the guy, <laughs> pretend to be the lightning. The colonel is coming, yeah. The colonel is coming, the colonel is coming. Um, but it was, you know. It I sounds like a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I was 21 years old, and I would, you know, traveling, going on location right. to shoot these things. And then eventually got to uh, work on movies because I knew a little bit about production from right. doing the commercials. Right. So what were some of the movies that, that you worked on? That you were on? Um, the very first movie I worked on uh, was um, not a box office success, mm -hmm. but it was very interesting. It was called Movie Movie. And it was actually two 45-minute movies that were both spoofs of uh, 1930s movies. Okay. Uh, it was written by Larry Gelbart and Sheldon oh, yeah. Keller, okay. and both uh, honored and esteemed comedy writers. Right. And Stanley Donnan was the director who directed a lot of the great musicals, uh, Singing in the Rain, uh -huh. and uh, other, others of the 50s there. But Stanley started when he was very young, when he was in his 20s, so he was still only in his mid-50s. 
And it was like, I'm working with Stanley yeah, Donovan, the guy who directed yeah. one of the yeah. top 10 movies of all time. Right, right. And then I worked on, of the other movies I worked on, I eventually got in the Director's Guild, was a second assistant director mm -hmm. uh, on the National Lampoon's Vacation movie, where they drive across country and go to the amusement park. Right. Um, and the other big hit movie I worked on was called Private Benjamin with Goldie Hawn. Sure, yeah. Jewish princess joins the army. Right, right. Well, you know, it's interesting because it will, when, the, probably a lot of people watching are like, that's what I want to do. I want to go from, you know, just being graduating from, from college to being in, in the, the movie or TV business. But it's, it's, it sounds like a lot, of, a lot of small breaks that you... It absolutely is. And, um, and some of it's serendipity. That first right. movie that I got on, uh, again, happened through my father, but in an accident. Uh, I was working in commercials. My father was talking to his ad agency producer about where to shoot a commercial, and they had a disagreement, and she said, don't you like this particular company? And he said, I have nothing against them. In fact, my son works there all the time. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, what does your son do? He's a production assistant. And she said, oh, my husband's an assistant director, and he's looking for a production assistant on a movie right now. Oh, yeah. And that person turned out to be a guy named Mark Johnson, who later won an Academy Award for producing Rain Man, mm -hmm. and, uh, right. and was Barry right. Levinson's producer. And the first assistant director, Mark, was the second AD. Was, uh, the first AD was Jonathan Sanger, who had an Oscar nomination for producing The Elephant Man. Mm -hmm. And these were people who became contacts for right, me. Yeah. Uh, so there was serendipity there. But the, the thing about serendipity is you have to follow through and actually do the job. Right, right. You know, if you, if you don't do a good job, they're not asking you back a second time. Yeah, right. Well, I want to I wanna move to, um, do you have a, a string of, of TV shows? I'm just going to read off a few for, okay. for viewers. Um, that people will, will recognize from the, the, the mid-80s onto the 90s. So the Cosby Show, Facts of Life, Who's the Boss, um, Step by Step, which we'll, and we can sort of yeah. focus on that. But um, what was it like to be part of a, you know, we think about now the third golden age of television. It's, it's a writer's, uh, well, I guess it was until a <laughs> couple <of> months ago, <laughs> in the writer's um, world. Um, it still is. Yeah, it still is. Um, was it like that back then? It absolutely was. It was first of all, it was incredibly ex as exciting. As exciting as it was to be on a, a movie set and, and to have met many of my mm -hmm. comedy heroes, Mel Brooks and Harold Ramis and so right. on. You know, Bill Cosby's a guy whose records I listened to when I was a 12-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And now I'm one of his writers. Right. And the show was number one. I was there for the second season of the show. So it was at the height of its popularity. People, we shot the show in New York, and that's where the writers worked, mm -hmm. too. Um, people would wait three, four hours in the snow to come in and see the show mm -hmm. live and mm -hmm. be part of the audience. And it was, you know, a really heady thing. I was the junior, junior writer on the show, but I learned so much from watching the senior writers and how they crafted a story and how they worked with the actors because uh, it's a collaborative medium there and worked mm -hmm. with the director, too. Well, something like that when you are the junior person, how much of what you write ever gets on screen? Is it a lot, a little bit, uh, here and there? It depends on the show, but in the case of The Cosby Show, very little of mm -hmm. what I wrote uh, uh, made it through. I, I remember the first joke I pitched that I actually got on the <laughs> air. It wasn't in a script I wrote, but we were doing rewrites. And uh, there was a sort of friendly banter, husband and wife banter going on between Cosby and Felicia Rashad. And he came in, and the six-year-old Rudy was there, and he said good night and kissed her, and then turned to the wife. And I pitched that he said, "I didn't even have to buy her dinner," <laughs> and that was the first joke I ever pitched. Got on TV. It's, it's got a lot of resonance now. <laughs> For, right, it probably would not. You know, when you're bringing up Bill Cosby in that context, it's probably yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's going to get a hashtag yeah, these days. Hashtag. Well, so how do you move in? Because you, I mentioned a number of shows, and I could have mentioned some more. How, how are you moving from one, one program to the next? Um, well, Cosby was the first uh, show that I was on staff on. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked there for a year, and then they did not renew my contract, although they, they offered me a script writing assignment. So it was kind mm -hmm. of a mixed message. They mm -hmm. couldn't have hated my writing. Uh, but I returned to California, and, and I was married, and I still am, and had mm -hmm. kids, and so on. So that was good. And my agent sent my script around, and I got hired on The Facts of Life. Okay. And, uh, and I did um, two seasons on The Facts of Life. And during the first season, there was a pilot that had been sold to ABC, a concept, by non-writing producers, one of whom was the actor Alan Thicke. 
Okay. And they needed a writer. And none of the super experienced writers wanted to take that job because mm. they did their own stuff. And right. so it kind of made its way down the food chain to me. Right. And I got hired to write this pilot that never got made, but ABC really liked the writing. And all of a sudden, I was on the list of people who would be approved to write a pilot. Oh. And then they called up the next year or two years later or something like that. and pitched uh, a show about teenage models living with uh, their mentor, mm -hmm. uh, an agent, and I said, and they asked for me to write right. and produce this, this show. This is Living Dolls. And this is a show called Living Dolls, right. which came and went in 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. But, and you know, it was clear, how, that's part of how you build a career. I, mm -hmm. I know why they were, it wasn't just because they liked my writing, but I had done The Facts of Life, which was off the air, and so it was a niche that was available mm -hmm. to the market. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, they want The Facts of Life with Thin Pretty Girls, and, mm -hmm. uh, and did with it. all due respect <laughs> to The Facts of Life yeah, Girls. Right, yeah. Um, and it wasn't a topic I was wildly enthusiastic mm -hmm. about, but I realized that it was going to get made. And it, there is this sort of hierarchy. Are you somebody who can get approved to write a pilot? Have you had a pilot made? Have you gotten a series on the air? Right. And so on. And so I did the pilot. Um, it uh, had two young actresses uh, who were unknowns at the time, but are known now, Halle Berry and uh, Leah Remini. Mm -hmm. Came and went in 10 episodes, but all of a sudden now, I'd gotten a show on the air, right, so I was right. on a different list. Right. And then from there, um, it's like my career was really hot. I did that show and supervised another pilot. Both shows got on the air that fall, so mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was a guy who had only been right. on staff for three or four years and got two shows right, on the air, right. and I was the hottest thing in Hollywood for about six months, and right. then both shows failed, <laughs> and I was... Back to dog food again. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was about to stand in for dogs again. Nobody wanted to hire me. But then I got hired at a company called Miller Boyette, who did a ton of the Paramount sitcoms, Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy, and were now doing um, sitcoms with their own company, uh, Full House and Perfect Strangers and others. And so I worked there for nine years, and that's where Step by Step, step came by step. about. So when you're, I mean, you know, as I'm a Primarily a poet is how I write, so <laughs> my um, rewards are pretty minimal <laughs> in general. Um, but it's still there's a lot of up and down. Like you feel like you get, I mean, you get a poem published, or you feel a success, you get a poem rejected. You're going through that on a kind of megawatt type of thing, where hey, I'm on TV, and then hey, I just my show got canceled. How does that affect your, you know, interior as a writer? You know, it, it does somewhat. I mean, when when Living Dolls came out, uh, the preview. Uh, upcoming fall preview edition of People Magazine rated all the new shows right. and I got an F. <laughs> and you know, it's like, wow, People Magazine just gave people, me an yeah. F, it's harsh. <laughs> but, um, but I was really enjoying what the process was. Mm -hmm. I got to go to work every day mm -hmm. and work with other writers. We, um, the material we wrote uh, for better and for worse, uh, some was good, some was not mm -hmm. good, but it got on the air. And right. it wasn't like what the, the movie writers talk mm -hmm. about development hell, where they have a script that Never, get, never sees option and it yeah, doesn't get right, made. Gets right. option, doesn't get made. The work was getting done, and you learn a lot as a writer when mm -hmm. you actually when you're writing for a performance medium. Mm -hmm. When you actually see the words being performed. So would you, would you go watch the show like with your family and friends and stuff like that? Did you get just people who didn't know you'd you'd written it? Maybe did you ever did you ever consume it in that particular? Venue, um, or would you always? Most of the time, I watch with yeah. my kids. My yeah. kids were the age of the, oh, the uh, core audience right, for those right. kind of shows there, right. and so it was really fun. Uh, in fact, uh, we did a Halloween episode on uh -huh. Step by Step once, and my daughter who was an extra in it there. But the the guest star was a thirteen year old Michelle Williams. Oh wow! Then. <laughs> but uh, but it was really fun, and you learn a lot seeing work getting done and. Um, you had a purpose every day. You were, we were going to go in there, and, I, and you'd, you'd have to make compromises, mm -hmm. especially with that kind of television where you're on a really demanding schedule. You're making 24 episodes in an eight-month period right, of time. Right. So for me, that means writing or supervising the writing on a 1,000 pages yeah. in eight months. And, and you're thinking in terms of, an, of a successful run being five, six, seven seasons long, right? Step by Step, we're in seven seasons. Yeah. And Cosby was nine, and yeah. uh, Facts of Life was nine. And uh, so, yeah, the, there's our... Shows that did 200 or close to 200 yeah. episodes each. Which, which is really different. You and I were talking before the camera started rolling about how uh, we mentioned Fleabag. It's a two season, six episode, half hour shows, right. and it's fantastic. It feels complete, it feels like a success. Um, yeah, you know, I, you, know but you, you were doing something really different even it's, as a showrunner. It's true. One of my favorite comedy moments in a movie is in the Mel Brooks movie, The History of the World, Part One. 
and he comes in one segment, he comes down as Moses from the mountaintop with three stone tablets right. and says, I bring you these 15. And then he trips and one of the tablets <laughs> shatters. Right. He says, these 10, 10 commandments. And I'm pretty sure that one of the commandments that was lost was not thou shalt only write TV shows that are 30 or 60 minutes. Right, right. And, and you know, it was just an arbitrary thing that existed for the purpose of advertising sure. so that people knew when to find the show and what time. That's not an issue anymore. Right, right. I don't know that anybody says, oh, I, I watch that show that's on at 8 o'clock on right, Wednesday right, night right, anymore. Yeah, they right. watch when they want to watch. Yeah. And it's great creatively for you. You're not beholden to the lowest common denominator. Or because you, you had three audience. networks and you're writing for all of America, right? I mean, that's your that's It's your true, and you, and you needed to be mindful. I mean, the, things that will seem silly now on Step by Step, we were not allowed to have the characters use the word hell okay. because the uh, more conservative parts of the country might object to that. Mm. And, you know, the... So you would, what'd you say is that? Shoot. Oh, we, we <laughs> found different ways of saying it. I, I remember pitching a, a, a story idea to them that the kids were teenagers then, and right. the story we pitched was that they wanted to go to a Woodstock-like event, an outdoor weekend right. rock concert, and Suzanne Summers' character, who was the mother, said absolutely not and was uncharacteristically rigid about right. this. Uh -huh. And it came out that she had gone to Woodstock and smoked pot and danced topless on a VW van. <laughs> and you would have thought that we had, you know, desecrated the flag or right, something. Right. The, the, the People did not went, want to see that character in that light. Oh, the, the network said, absolutely not. Okay. She, she, she danced topless. If she smoked pot, she did it once and she thought it was right. the biggest she, mistake she, of her she life. She didn't inhale, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it was, and it was crazy because from a storyteller's point of view, I was a baby boomer parent, and that was a real issue we were mm -hmm. dealing with. Is mm -hmm. now we had to discipline our kids and tell them to do things that you did you can't yourself. Do what I did, <laughs> and, right. and that to me was you know that's good storytelling when you're doing family television right. there to deal with real issues, right. you know, not in a you know uh, as the facts of life used to do a very special episode yeah. where uh, 2D's <laughs> friend gets cancer or something right, like right, that, right. but just to talk about everyday life, and that's where I you know we all. Uh, got a lot of our materials from our own lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when I would come in at the beginning of a season and we'd have to come up with would you stories. you be taking notes when your kids do I'd, stuff? Yeah, I'd spend the first two, three days with the writers just saying, okay, this is the, the kids grow mm -hmm. in real time on the show. And so you say, okay, this one's a junior in high school. What happens during that time mm -hmm. of your life? Well, you take the SAT, you get your mm -hmm. driver's license, you go to the prom, and, and that's where the stories mm -hmm. had a great similarity because yeah. that's what kids do at that time. Mm -hmm. But you just say, anybody going through this in their, their real life with their... And people would start throwing ideas in. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and you'd, they'd just say, so I just did that. My 12-year-old my just did this. And, or when I was 12, <laughs> this is what happened to me. Right, right. And uh, that's also part of what made that experience really fun for me, is that these were the shows that my kids adored. And right. so to be able to share that experience yeah. with them while they were growing up, although they really didn't like it when they saw themselves portrayed <laughs> in some way, or they would assume it was that way. Right. My wife would say, how can you say I never did that? Yeah, like, say, no, that's not my life. That's yeah. not you, it's this character. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, we got about 10 minutes left, and sure. I, I want to kind of move from that time, you know, it was just a, a frantic time of writing for, for network television. Um, what was sort of the next stage of your, your career? The next stage of my career was to not have a career. Um, when I got to the end of the 90s, I was, quote, old by television standards. Mm -hmm. I was 45, six years old. Okay. But more importantly, the shows that I had done, all these shows we've talked about, Facts yeah. of Life, Step by Step, and so on, they just seemed old fashioned to everybody at that mm -hmm. point in time. And you, there's some typecasting that goes on when you have a career. And so all the things that- That you were associated with. I was associated shows, yeah. with and that had yeah. made hundreds of millions of dollars for the studio. Right. Now all of a sudden I was, uh, I couldn't get arrested. And did, so did you ever take that in like, okay, maybe they're right. Maybe I am too old to be writing on this. I never thought maybe I'm too old to be writing. Mm -hmm. I, I did think I may be too old to enjoy being there till midnight doing rewrites <laughs> right. there and so on. But I thought, look, it's incumbent on me to write new material. Okay. And, and that's the beauty of being a writer. If you're a director, somebody's got to hire you, although now not so much with the digital age mm -hmm. and YouTube and so on. But if you're a writer, you, you, you got a pencil, you got a piece of paper, you mm -hmm. can write. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we use computers now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, I, just, you just kept writing. I just kept writing and I tried different things. Uh, and I also started teaching. Mm -hmm. And that was- uh, This is at Chapman University? Actually, before Chapman, my oh. first uh, gig, again, serendipity even in teaching, I had dinner with one of the writers from Step by Step and her husband and my wife, 
And she had been teaching at Cal State Northridge, and okay. she taught a sitcom writing class. And I said, how did you get that job? I'm interested in starting that mm -hmm. now. She said, oh my God, I can't teach the class this uh, starting in two weeks, and they're <laughs> you, desperate for, <laughs> you got for somebody. Yank. This was a Sunday night, and by Monday at noon, the, the yeah. school, had, the chair had called me, and wow. I was hired. Wow. And I went, and I really liked it. And I had this fascinating teaching experience three weeks in. I did lectures about structure and showed clips and all of mm -hmm. that stuff. And then I decided to uh, just try an exercise to help them learn how to develop a story idea from a germ of an idea to a fully fleshed out mm -hmm. story. And I came in and said, okay, I just thought up this premise on the way to work, so I don't know what the story right. is, but the premise is for, for the TV show Frasier. Then Frasier and Niles discover they're dating the same woman. Okay. Everybody agree that's a good basic premise, they did. So I turned to them and said, okay, now what do we do to make it into a story? And they just got the, you know, the deer in the headlights, terrified look on their faces. But what they said were, in panic was great. What they said was, well, how did they find out that they're dating this woman? And then what did they do when they found out? And then uh, how did they meet her in the first place? And I just said, there's a story. That's, <laughs> guys, that's what writing is. Yeah. And I realized my job as an educator is to help them learn to think like a writer, or another way to say it is, how do you how do writers problem solve? Mm -hmm. um, probably a little bit different in poetry, but but still yeah. But when tools. I when I'm writing when I'm writing for the stage, it's the same thing. You you have somebody you imagine a situation, you put them in there, and you imagine these factors, these obstacles that they have to get around, and then boom, you start thinking. You're, you're problem solving, you know. Right, and you and you ask the questions, answer them ten different ways, and then see which one seems mm -hmm. most promising to you. Yeah. There. Yeah. Uh, so I really like teaching. Uh, I started teaching part-time at various places at USC, at Chapman University, and the dean at Chapman came to me and said, we'd like to hire you, but you have to get an MFA, a mm -hmm. Master of Fine Arts right. degree. This and is I, for a guy who's written <laughs> right, billions looked, of looked, words. That's what I, yeah, said. I yeah. said, what are you talking about? Right. I created TV shows right. for big networks right. and stuff, and he said, I know, it's academia. It was a, it was so life changing. This is, this for is me. and this is a low residency at Goddard, right? At Goddard, I went yeah. to Goddard College uh, in Vermont. Uh, it was a low residency writing program, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And it was it got me to write stuff other than television. I started writing plays because of my experience there, um, and I got hired. I got the degree and got hired at mm -hmm. Chapman, mm -hmm. and taught there for ten years and really enjoyed it. Um, and was in more than just teaching. I was building the television program for mm -hmm. them. They had a broadcast journalism program, but yeah. not comedies and dramas. And then the clock goes by again, and once again, serendipity happens. I moved to Santa Barbara, <laughs> and I see an ad in the local newspaper that they're looking for someone yeah. to be the program director of a low residency right. MFA that they're starting. Uh, where you develop the original Well, curriculum. and I can remember um, being on that committee, and there's like, oh, there's this guy who just <laughs> is in town now. He's got a lot of stuff. He's been teaching for 10 years, and we all said, he sounds perfect, and sure enough, you were. It, it was, and so the thing that's great about, uh, so I teach now at Antioch University in Santa Barbara, and we have a low residency program, which means it's suitable for people who have full-time jobs mm -hmm. and families. They mm -hmm. only have to be physically in Santa Barbara two weeks out of the year, one in June and one in December, and we have seminars and workshops, and we don't have courses. We pair them with a mentor. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the best way to teach creative writing, Agreed. in my yeah, opinion. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've been building that program, and we've started graduating students now. And yeah, so with the, just for the folks who are in the yeah. program right now, where are they from? They're from all over. I really only have one student who lives in the Central Coast re oh, wow. region. Yeah, no, uh -huh. The rest come from Ohio, New York. I mean, that's the beauty of low residency mm -hmm. programs is yeah. that you're not bound by geography. Um, Santa Barbara is not an unattractive it's an destination. It's a appealing place to go for a week, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a great place to visit there. Uh, same thing with the faculty. I'm not reliant on having to find faculty who live in Santa Barbara. I have some faculty from Los Angeles mm -hmm. and one from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it means you're really liberated from mm -hmm. a lot of constraints that right. exist when yeah. you're geographically based. So one of the, the one of your books is is called Bite Size Television: Create Your Own TV Series for the Internet. Are you when you're working with these students now? Um, are are you encouraging them to write outside the the, the, the normal box, the old TV we, box? We do for for sure because they they have to if they want to work. You right, gotta, right. It's got to be fresh there. But the great opportunity of the internet uh, for students is that, as I said, you learn a ton when you actually see your work produced. 
Nothing gives you religion about tightening your dialogue mm -hmm. faster than sitting in the editing room and watching a speech mm -hmm. and going, my God, this it goes is on endless. forever. Yeah. Cut this thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but it also means you can display your talents out there. And people, if you write a, a web series that has, say, five minute episodes and so on, people are much more willing to spend five minutes watching an episode mm -hmm. than they are to spend a half an hour or an hour or whatever reading scripts. Yeah. And so a lot of talent is being discovered uh, on the internet now yeah. because people display their work there. And I, I mean, I, I just finished teaching my playwriting unit at, at City College and I found there was a resistance to students to really looking hard at the work. Is that, and when you're at the graduate level, is that less the case, would you say? No, and even at the look, even at the professional level, <laughs> yeah, we, it's, we, it's we, fine. What's wrong with it? We yeah. all right. We all want the same thing. When you give a, a piece of it's work perfect, to someone, yeah. you want them to say, "You're a freaking genius. Yeah. Don't change Don't a change comma. A word, Just yeah. make space on your shelf for your Oscar and, and all of that." <laughs> right. But you know what you really need is some feedback there. And you know one of the things I've learned about feedback, uh, this is especially true with network television. You know, you get notes from the network, and we all loathe getting notes from the network. But what I learned was. Yes, they're terrible at telling you how to fix your script. Yes, they're terrible at telling you exactly what's wrong with your script. But they had an uncanny ability to put their finger on the spot where there was something wrong mm -hmm. with the script. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I sort of liken it to um, mechanics and cars. If I'm driving my car and I hear a funny noise, I can lift the hood, but it's not going to do me any good. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to yeah, figure out right. what's wrong with yeah. it. But if I go in and say it goes ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk, then the professional right. person can I either write identify in this case, it. Right. Yeah, in this yeah. case, the writer yeah. can diagnose what's wrong and um, <laughs> suggest treatment and improvement for right. it there. Right. We amazingly just have about one minute of, wow. of time left. This is, I, I feel like I've, I've been in some kind of a whirlwind <laughs> following your career. Um, but I always like to, to have the, the guests sort of end with a little, you know, piece of advice to an aspiring writer. So in, you know, 45 seconds, a minute or so, what would you, what would you say to folks? Well, look, there's, there's only uh, three ways to get better at writing. That's by reading, by writing, and by talking about reading and writing. Okay. And the last one is the least important one. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to read. That's number one. That's number one. And that mean, that includes if you're writing for, for television you're or movies, you need you to read, read scripts. scripts. Yeah. And you've got to write. And um, the, the more you write, the better you're going to get at it. Um, I, I had occasion to uh, speak with Richard Russo, uh, accomplished mm -hmm. novelist, right, right, Pulitzer right. Prize winner, and, and a screenwriter. And he was a professor to start out with, but then wanted to do creative writing, gave his story to one of the creative writers down the hall. And that person's advice was, start writing now because everybody's got to get about a thousand bad pages out of their system <laughs> before they get to anything good. And in your case, it might be 2,000. <laughs> and and he, he's done well. Right. Uh, I'm going to have to end on that anecdote. It's an anecdote that it says hard work, but it also says that things can pay off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, uh, you know, hard work and that's enjoyable work. That's yeah. what you want to do, so do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ross thank Brown, you. for being on the show. Thanks, David. The Creative Community is a co-production of TVSB and CAPS Media in Ventura. Here in Santa Barbara, it is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation and produced also by the fabulous J.P. Montalvo and his fantastic crew. I'm David Starkey, and we'll see you next time.